Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. I'm Patrick Spencer. I'll be your host tonight. We've got a great show tonight. We've got Alistair Simon here, and he's going to talk about a really cool uh, wide field mosaic that he's been working on. Uh, but before we get to the presentation, I uh, just wanted to touch on a couple of things about the upcoming schedule. So let me just pull up the calendar here quickly. All right, so you can see we've got a number of interesting programs coming up here over the next few weeks. Uh, next week, Linda Thomas Fowler will be here and she's going to uh, talk about uh, autonomous sequencing in NINA. Uh, and then just note that the following week, we've got the annular eclipse uh, that weekend. And so we're taking that weekend off. So we won't have a show on October 15, uh, but then we'll be back and we've got a neat show about the uh, Aurora, which should be good since this is uh, supposed to be such a good year for, uh, for Aurora. Um, and then we've got a few other uh, things scheduled. Uh, and if you look down here, though, you'll see on uh, November 19, we've got Adam Block coming. He's going to talk about the uh, new color mapping script that he just released. Um, but after that, we are wide open. So if anyone out there, if you've got any ideas for a, a presentation that you'd like to give, a talk that you've been thinking about uh, presenting here on the Astro Imaging channel, uh, now's your chance. So uh, just send us an email, contact us, and we will see about getting you on the program. So with that, let me stop sharing this one. All right, so as you saw there from the from the schedule, uh, next week we've got Linda Thomas Fowler and she's here with us tonight and she's going to tell us just a little bit about uh, what she'll be what she'll be sharing next week. Uh, so Linda, are you uh, are you ready to do that? Sure thing. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so one of the problems in dealing with observatories and first world problems is once you have it there, how do you manage it from night to night to night, deciding what targets to do, how long to spend on each target? And then you're, you're spending a lot of time dealing with your sequences from night to night. Well, I was part of a team at SRO, and we decided to take a look at the new target scheduler plugin in Nina. We built a sequence around that that actually runs 24-7 and autonomously decides when to image, what to image and it'll even take flats and darks for us if we request it to. So we're gonna go through how that's put together and, and what the requirements were for us being comfortable with actually deploying it and trusting the equipment to it. Oh, that sounds that sounds great. So, and I'm sure that'll be a, a popular episode. And there's, I know there's just so many folks that are using Nina these days, uh, as we had Tom Palmer on just a couple of weeks ago to give us some of that data about just how many downloads and uh, what not so so that'll be that'll be great so then that brings us to tonight's presentation uh, and as I mentioned uh, we've got Alistair Simon here tonight uh, and I'm sure many of you remember the last time that uh, that A Alistair was on the program it was about three years ago in uh, in November of 2020 and in that episode Alistair had uh, had demonstrated some some really innovative and, and interesting techniques for for capturing and processing mosaics. Uh, and since that last appearance, he's been working on a massive, uh, massive wide field mosaic from uh, Sagittarius to, to Cygnus. Uh, and tonight he's gonna tell us all about it. So Alistair, uh, are you ready? If so yeah, I'll hand off to you. Yep. You can okay. start your presentation. All right, I'm gonna share the screen here. And uh, hopefully you'll see it in full screen mode in a second. That look okay? Yep, we got it. Looks good. Okay, great. All right. Well, yep. Thanks for the introduction. So, uh, just a little bit about me before we get going. Um, I've been in astrophotography now for about twenty-five years. I started back in nineteen ninety-seven when the very first digital cameras were coming out. 
I started with a Mi Dell X10 and the Starlight Express MX5, I think it was at the time. Tiny chip, you had to do your guiding manually with a little hand paddle. And uh, very quickly, I discovered that uh, taking uh, images through digital techniques at that focal length of about two meters is, is not very easy to do. And you can't get very long images doing a hand paddle before uh, your back just gives out, even though I was relatively young at the time. Um, so over the years, I, I've moved on to different equipment. And I, I went away from um, the long focal length telescopes into uh, shorter focal length wide field. And, and what I'm going to talk about here is with wide field, we're talking about focal lengths of about, you know, five, 530 millimeters and below. But there's ways that I've discovered in the last year that you can get really massive fields of view at still pretty good resolutions with a uh, 135 millimeter camera lens. So we'll be going into to some of the things I've been doing there. I'll reference back to some of the techniques I talked about last time I was on the show. And uh, we'll uh, have a good time. So what I'm going to go through, first of all, is when you're doing wide field imaging, what are the different focal lengths and field of views? And, and what ones should you go for? Because I've tried a lot. And I've eventually settled on something in the last year that I really like. Um, I'll talk about the equipment that I've got. We'll go into this extreme mosaic that I've kind of built up over probably uh, three, three or four years now between my 530 FSQ 106 and uh, this 135 millimeter lens. I'll talk about how I acquire images. And then I'll talk quite a bit about the processing challenges and the image registration and, and how you really do that um, uh, uh, well with wide field uh, images to bring out some very faint detail. So in these little pictures up here, you can kind of see this is a representation of the different focal lengths. You know, 530 millimeters, which is my FSQ 106. There's the North America and Pelican Nebula. Um, that's a two frame mosaic taken with that camera. You zoom out through an 85 millimeter lens and you can see a lot more in the field of view. Um, but uh, I've, I've embedded some of the FSQ 106 data in there and we'll talk about that technique uh, coming up as well. And then at 14 millimeters, which is the star background resolution here, you can see you're zooming out even further into the detail. So it's always going to be a compromise between how big a field of view you want and how much detail you want in your images. But there's ways to kind of bridge that quite nicely. So let's talk about this focal length question. So this table that I've got here actually represents my setups that I've tried probably over the last five years or so. Um, I've had two cameras, uh, an SBIG STXL 11002. And the interesting thing there is that has nine micron pixels. And then about a year ago, I got myself an ASI 6200 mm and that has 3.76 micron pixels. So that has nice implications for the types of uh, rigs that you can build. So I was predominantly over the last five years trying this STXL 11002 uh, on my FSQ 106 at 530 millimeters. It's got a resolution of 3.5 arc seconds a pixel, and it's got a field of view of about four by three degrees. That is considered wide field, but I like to go really wide field. And so if I was to try and do a mosaic, for example, of Cygnus with that setup, which I've done, you're talking about taking 60 different images and stitching them all together just to cover the constellation. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of data collection. And it gives you a great result at the end with the resolution, but it's a lot of work. So I started experimenting with not just the FSQ 106 on this camera, but different camera lenses. And the one that I was using probably most often was the 85 millimeter Sigma. And with that camera, I was getting 21.8 arc seconds per pixel and a really nice field of view, 24 by 16 degrees. But that resolution of 21.8, it's not that high. It's way, way, way undersampled. So when I was looking through the new capabilities of systems, I realized that with the ASI 6200 and its 3.76 micron pixels, I could use 135 millimeter camera lens. I could get 5.7 arc seconds per pixel, which is only about 40%. I'm only losing 40% of the resolution to the FSQ 106. And I've got this field of view that's about 12 times the area. So the nice thing is 
I can do very wide field with this. And some of the mosaics that I've taken in the past with the 106, I can embed within that because these resolutions are not that different. And when you embed those together, it's hard to see that there were actually any images taken at different resolutions. And we'll, we'll see that coming up. So I have now settled onto this 135 millimeter Rokinon lens and this FSQ 106 530. But pretty much every image I've taken over the last year has been with this ASI 6200 because I had a lot of previous images and data from the FSQ 106. So let's talk now about um, what the equipment actually looks like when you see it all set up. So in my observatory, I have a Paramount MX mount. There's the FSQ 106. There's the SDXL 11002. Uh, I run it all from an Intel Nook mounted up on the, uh, the telescope itself. There's my FS FSQ 106. There's my flip flat that I use for taking flats of the FSQ 106. And right mounted on here is the um, astrograph that I'm going to talk about that I built with um, the 135 millimeter Rokinon lens. Now, on that, I image at f4. And you'll see some of the pictures coming up. The reason I do f4 is for two reasons. That even though the lens is capable of f2, that's its starting f ratio. And that obviously gives you uh, a very fast uh, data collection. If you run it at f2, there's two things that will get in your way. One is the stars aren't as crisp as they really need to be in the outer corners of a full frame uh, chip. And the other is that at f2, if you're using filters, narrowband filters like I am at the moment, then you're going to need some special f2 rated narrowband filters versus the ones that work on all the other telescopes of f4 and above. And the reason for that is if you're using an f2 lens or a lens at f2, that moves, distorts the light enough as it bends the light to get that uh, amazing light grasp into the small area. Um, it distorts that so that the actual wavelength of the light moves off the normal sweet spot that it would be at for the filter. So an H alpha filter, uh, when you're using it, you're using a, a standard H alpha filter at F2, you're gonna find that it's quite dim. You're not getting all that H alpha light through because the band pass has been moved by the F2 of the optics. So rather than you know, spend on a brand new set of narrowband filters, I had a set of standard uh, filters for narrowband. I decided to go at F4. And so that's, that's what I use for that particular, uh, all my imaging on that camera. Um, so let's talk about the astrograph itself. I was, it was kind of interesting because I, I just came across some of the, the, the key component that, that, that made me decide to build this by accident. And, and I was looking on the web, at different things that, that were out there for holding uh, camera lenses. And I came across these Astrodimium uh, 3D printed uh, rings, specially made to hold the Rokinon 135 millimeter lens, which I happened to have and wanted to try out as an astrograph. So that's a really nice system because it not only holds the lens, but it mounts as a mount there for a focuser, an EAF ZWO focuser. And it also has the uh, gear teeth for the lens and the, the belt here that lets you auto focus the 135 millimeter lens, which I, which I really like because uh, I, I had to kind of hand craft the previous uh, version that I'd used on the Sigma lens. There was nothing like this that I could have used. And I thought that was a really neat design. So I got that. I put my focuser on it. Um, you can just see the lens here kind of hidden by all the uh, stuff around it. There's the lens hood there. And then on this, I use a ZWO 7 by 50 millimeter filter wheel and a full frame chip ASI 6200 mm Pro. And this is all mounted on a Prima Luce dovetail mount. I just happened to have that. You could use anything, but that was one that happened to have lying around. And so I put all this together and uh, it really does work very well. Um, it sits on top of the main FSQ 106 scope. It doesn't weigh very much um, uh, and it's, it performs very well. So while I was doing this, I did learn a few things that uh, were interesting with this astrograph. So the first thing was I learned just how critical it is to have the lens flange of the uh, Canon EF Rokinon uh, uh, 135 at the exact right distance to the sensor on the ASI 6200. 
um, the lens distance or the, the, the distance that they specify is 44 millimeters. So that's from the lens flange to the sensor in the ASI. And you do that in this case by, you have to remove the tilt tip plate from the ASI camera. You have to screw it directly to the filter wheel. Um, and then you have to use the ZWO low profile EF mount adapter. So you put that system together and it equals 44 millimeters because you've got 12.5 millimeters from the camera face to the sensor, another 20 for the filter wheel, their EF mount adapter from ZWO is specially designed to be that 11.5 that you need to bring this to 44. So what went wrong with that? Well, the first images that I got, there was a lot of coma in the corners and a lot of elongated stars in the corners. And that was even with the lens at F4. And I was pretty sure that that wasn't due to the lens. Uh, it was due to some way that I'd mounted the lens against the camera. So I did some more research online and I found that yes, that was indeed the case. The thing that you need to take into account is to adjust the sensor distance to take into account the effect of the filters that you're using in the filter wheel. And I found this handy little formula uh, rule of thumb online where if you take the thickness of the filters in millimeters and divide by three, and then add that to your back focus distance without filters, that's what you need. So I was 0.67 millimeters off because my filters are two millimeters thick. Divide that by 3.67 millimeters. So I needed to put a little spacer between that EF mount adapter um, and uh, the filter wheel uh, to add 0.67 millimeters. Well, the good thing is you can purchase these little lens spacers or shims pretty much anywhere in, in camera shops and astronomy shops. They cost about $10 and you fit those in and it really makes a difference. And I'm gonna show you the eventual stars that I ended up with. They're not perfect, but they were a lot better than I had before I added that 0.67 millimeters to the back focus. So here uh, you can see um, the Rokinon 135 in action, right? The, the, the picture on the right is that, uh, from the center of um, uh, the lens. So it's looking at the central portion of the frame. And you can see here, it's a 10 minute unguided H alpha filter image at F4. The stars are all tack sharp um, and you know there's no distortion of any kind. Now, if you go up into this case, the upper left corner of the full frame sensor, it's not so good, but there's little traces of coma here. The stars are a little elongated, but before I put the shim in, that was a lot, lot worse. So do pay attention when you're building some of these systems just to make sure that you've got the right back focus distance and do take into account the filters because they alter it. And uh, if you don't get that alteration right on a full frame sensor, I think that can make quite a difference. Um, but this, when, you, when you're talking about um, you know, a, a, an image that contains 62 megapixels, uh, and you put that on a screen and these are in the top left or bottom right of the corner, you, you don't notice that these stars are perfectly round. It's only if you go like zooming right in that you might see that. So I was pretty pleased with that performance that I got it to achieve there. And then here's an example of the vignetting that you get at F4. Um, this is a, a flat field um, uh, with the full frame sensor. Uh, there's vignetting as you can see in the corners, but when I apply this flat field to the images, that all gets corrected out. There's really no issue at all with it. So um, I'm gonna talk now about uh, how you can use this setup to do really extreme mosaics. So wide field mosaics, these are some examples, right? So I mentioned the one in the left-hand side before. This was a mosaic that I finished last year. It was all done with the STXL FSQ 106. Um, and I took 65 images to get that mosaic put together. It took 400 hours of data collection and it's a field of view of 17 by 18 degrees. Now contrast this with this image in the center. This is a six image mosaic using the 135 millimeter and the ASI camera. It's only 40, it's 60% uh, it's of the resolution of the image on the left. So it's not that far away. But because of the fact that I've got this really large field of view for the 135, I've now covered 28 by 24 degrees with six images 
with six, 36 hours of images, and that's a lot less work. <laughs> so, so the great thing is, you, th this this little lens will give you comp when matched with a camera with small pixels, will give you really good resolution and cover a very large field of view. Um, and this image that I've got on the right here is another mosaic I took with the FSQ 106, 54 hours, seven by 13 degrees. And the reason I'm going to show you that one is it's going to come into play in a minute um, because what if we now try to extend this 135 millimeter six image mosaic to 27 images and then we embed these two images here within it? What do you get? Well, you get this. This is the, the Milky Way from Sagittarius all the way up to Cygnus. And the majority of this image is just taken with that 135 millimeter lens um, and the 27 images are all stitched together. Um, it's 110 hours of data collection uh, through narrowband filters, obviously. Um, and what I did within this image, though, is I used those two other images that we looked at previously. So the 63 mosaic image of Cygnus and the 12 image mosaic of uh, the central core here. And I've embedded them in the, in the 135 millimeter data. And that gives that area some extra detail and sharpness but it's very hard to tell that I've actually done that because the resolutions of the 135 and the FSQ 106 when used with these two different cameras are relatively close together. And that makes this technique actually, I think, work better, much better than when I've used it in the past with an 85 millimeter lens. I'll come back to an example of that right at the end of the talk. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Alistair. Yes, go ahead. Alistair, do you have a moment for I do. a question this is, or two? It's a good place, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt. Nope. Uh, we asked, do you plan to purchase pre-shifted filters to image at a faster F-ratio? No, I'm not going to do that because um, the reason being that if I turned that lens to F2, now nah, the stars would go, wouldn't be as nearly as good in the corners. And, and so I've, I've kind of compromised on at the F4 being the right focal ratio for a couple of reasons. So is that stopped down at all? Um, that's my, my lens there. It's stopped down from F2 to F4. F4. And do you happen to have an image of the just the hydrogen alpha in this? Uh, let me see. Do I? No, I do not have it on the presentation. If anyone's interested and would like to contact me, I can send it to them. Well, I was interested in how it compared to uh, the complete Milky Way image that we heard it was a few weeks ago. Oh yes, from Sean Walker. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, here's the so here's the thing, right? Um, I actually assembled this mosaic in stages, so I tended to work on bits at a time, and I actually did the full color uh, narrowband image of this region here. We were looking at that on the previous page, and then this region here. And I processed them as self-contained images and then stitched them together in the color form. So I've never actually gone in back and produced a hydrogen alpha that covers this whole re region just as a single image. But it, it's interesting now that you mentioned it because I, I probably will go do that and just see how it compares to Sean's data. I do know, having looked at his data, because he's using a resolution very similar to the FSQ 106 and the STXL yes, that I'm, I'm using there's more detail there's going to be more detail in that than this but but this gives you a lot of the same effect for a lot less work i he's been working on that for what 10 years uh, <laughs> i thought years. it was eight but whether it was eight or ten i don't think we, yeah <laughs> we, and I, we I, really I, have to quibble although i have patience i'm not sure i have that much patience no we don't uh any other questions from our group well if not uh please continue okay all right so how do I acquire the data first? Well, as you heard earlier, next week there's going to be a talk on Nina. Uh, well, I happen to use um, Starkeeper Voyager to run my observatory, which I actually found out about through the Astro Imaging Channel. I wouldn't have known about this unless I watched a show from two or three years back, which was very interesting. And I'm like, this could solve quite a few problems for me. And, and so it did. Um, so I use Voyager. It, it's good for me because I can use its drag script to automate everything in my observatory from opening the roof uh, to, to controlling the image sequence. And it's also very reliable. I've used other um, 
you know, image acquisition uh, software uh, uh, like CCD Autopilot. And this is probably the most reliable imaging software that I've tended to use. So it's, um, it, it's very good for that. But being a mosaic person, the bit that I want to talk about is it has this really good web interface that makes it extremely easy to plan mosaics and then generate a sequence. Now, until I had used Voyager, I was doing all my mosaic planning in uh, the Sky X, and, and that works well. Um, but I'll show you with a, with a quick demo coming up um, exactly why um, I really like this web interface in Voyager. So let's go and have a look at that. So this is just, uh, we'll just watch a little video that I, that I did earlier, and we'll show you um, uh, exactly how you do this mosaic planning in Voyager. So this is its web interface. Um, scroll down to the virtual field of view. You can see down here, this is where it's using a field of view that's configured within Voyager for my camera setup. So this one happens to be, it says camera lens, ASI 6200 profile. That knows about the pixel sizes and the dimension of um, uh, my camera setup, which is important because it now uses that to size this image, uh, the, the image frame that we're going to be looking at, what's uh, where we're going to place it. That's the exact size of my camera setup on the sky. So if we wanted to now go and plan a mosaic around Cygnus, how would we do that? Well, let's just uh, start this uh, uh, demo here. We're going to go and type in in the top, oop, top right. Went too far. Let me start that again. We uh, type in in the top right, North America. It's going to uh, search for the North America nebula. We'll find that. Well, there it is. Popped it into. That's my single image field of view. I can adjust the brightness, and it's got a kind of a, a bit of a real start, real time sky survey map there, that, or pictures that you can use to really make sure your mosaic is over where you want it. You just select the number of images you want horizontally, the number vertically, and then you can position the object right where you want it in that frame setup you just did. And then you click on the RoboClip, which is the date image database. You import the images. You think of a suitable name to save them as. And that is your mosaic plan. How easy is that? Pretty easy. And now when that's in the database, I can now use that to any time when I want to build an image sequence for the evening, I can just import that from the database into my sequence run, and I can choose which of those images I want to image for that night, what filters, for how long, et cetera. But I found this has you know, made mosaic planning, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think you can make it any easier than that. So let's talk about Okay, we've collected all that data. Um, how do we want to do the image processing? Um, now this is my standard image workflow that I do for each image. I only use three pieces of software. I use CCD stack for dark frame and flat field calibration. I use Registar for image registration, and we'll see quite a bit of that coming up. And then I use this back to CCD stack again for doing the statistical pixel rejection and mean combines that we're all used to. And then everything else is done in Photoshop. Um, I have used PixInsight, but uh, just with my flow and my experience, it makes sense for me to keep going with Photoshop. And there's been some things that came out in the last 18 months that really have changed quite, quite um, a, a large amount of what I do in my workflow. It's made it better and easier. And that's all down to Russell Croman's um, recent releases of Star Exterminator a noise exterminator. So I use all of Russell's pro, uh, uh, plugins now in my workflow. I'd always kind of use Gradient Exterminator as required on some images. But, but just in the last year or so, I've started to use Star Exterminator. And I have to say that I always knew that you have to separate the stars from the background in order to stretch the background well enough for these faint nebulas um, in order for them to appear without stretching the stars at the same time so that they over dominate the image. And I tried a number of different techniques for that. I tried some of the other plugins and they all left artifacts um, when it came to uh, the end result, the, 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 the background with the stars removed. You'd have artifacts of the original stars in places that you'd have to go and patch up later. So I ended up 
implementing my own scheme with median filter and, and a few other uh, subtraction techniques in Photoshop um, that worked, but it isn't nearly as good as Star Exterminator. I'll tell you that that is, I have never seen it fail to completely remove stars without leaving any artifact behind. It is 100%, it's, it's, it's that good. The only thing that I had to, to realize, and I realized it quite quickly, is on some of my images, there's, a, there's an option when you run the Star Exterminator in Photoshop to decide whether you want to have something called large tile overlap. And that's talking about the overlap of the tiles that the AI algorithm is using um, when it's dividing up the image in order to um, determine uh, what are stars and how to remove them. And on, on some of these large, large wide field images, if you don't click that, you kind of get a, a square tessellation pattern that appears in the image. But you click the large tile overlap, that resolves that completely. It just means it takes longer to process because that's a more um, compute uh, intensive operation. Um, and then noise exterminator, I've used that too. I've tried many different noise removal pack packages in the past and many different ones. But I really like this one because basically you can just tell it to do it and the result you get, you keep. You don't have to do any fancy things with, you know, masking to make sure that you don't, you know, take noise away from areas that are already well defined because it already knows how to avoid doing that when it decides how it's going to do it on an AI basis. So I would highly recommend those last two uh, options. That they really improved my images. I could not have done that image that I showed you earlier without these. Um, now, I would say that uh, if you have a GPU and you want to use the Star Exterminator or Noise Exterminator, I highly recommend you do that. Um, I recently upgraded my desktop because it was a few years old, and I decided I would get myself an NVIDIA GPU, not one of the high-end ones, but kind of mid-range one. And you can set that up following the instructions on the link at the bottom here. Russell's giving you the instructions for it tells you how to set that up so you can use it with his plugins. And it does work. It reduced my star removal on a 62 megapixel image from 20 minutes to 10. So given that that 20 minutes was by far the uh, biggest portion of processing each panel for me, uh, that's a huge time saving. So I highly encourage a GPU if you, uh, if you want to use these, uh, these techniques with large images, large numbers of pixels in the image. So I'm going to show you now how I process one of these panels from the beginning to the end. It's not doesn't take very long because I'm quite quick at it. And you'll see kind of the speed that I go at. And I'll talk through what I'm doing as I do it. And you'll see the effect of some of these uh, filters from Russell Crowe. So here we go. So first of all, that's the first image. I'm going to do a level stretch to bring the white point right down. So I start to see some stars in the image. You can just start to see them appear. And now I'm going to go into an iterative process of curve adjustment. I'm boosting the curves. And I'll talk about that little why I pull that down at the top there in a minute. And we keep going here. We just need some curves adjustments. We're trying to brighten the faint detail in the image. And we're probably going to have to do and do a, a, a levels adjustment now to bring up the black point because I've got to, I've got to set that right without clipping any of the main data. Now we've got to do another curves again. And you'll see I bring down this thing at the top. That is to avoid over bloating the star cores. That's something I decided I, I, I like that technique a while back because if you don't bring the top down like that on some of the images I used to process, the stars got out of control. If you, if you did that, then you'd get a really nice tight, bright core and a halo around the star, which I preferred. So, um, that's why I bring that top down on the curve. But at some point, and I think we're getting pretty close. Yep, this is it. Well, if I brighten that image anymore, I'm going to over dominate the stars in it. But I'd like to brighten the background some more. So I go in and I click this action that came from Russell Crowman, Star Exterminator. Click. And that kicks, that kicks off his program, but it's going to do it in such a way it's going to leave me with two layers, a star layer and a background layer. And it's going to do all the work for me. It'll take 10 minutes to do it, which we're not going to sit through. We're going to see, there you go. That's That was it just there. It, uh, you saw it. And now we can go into uh, just adjust the background in the starless version that it gave us. And when we adjust this, 
we'll adjust all that faint detail in the image and we didn't brighten the stars much better so um it, it just it, it makes producing some of these uh bringing out the really faint nebulosity very easy to do um, and it's a very very accurate and reliable process and now i'm going to just do that noise exterminator filter to get rid of some of that background noise there but just look at that image there you can see there are really no artifacts at all left over by that star removal haven't seen that done by any other software that i've used uh, he's really done a good job on it so when that finishes you get a very nice smooth background oh, it went too fast but so you get a nice smooth background on that and then that's the image done it doesn't take very long to do a single panel so having done a panel um how do we start to build up the mosaic so what we're going to do now is we're going to take two images that have been processed and we're going to register them using register to um uh bring those two together in the correct way so that they're, they're they're correctly overlapped with each other and we're going to use photoshop then to blend them together and then what you would do then is save that larger image that you just made that two images you flatten it down you save it and then you go into register again and take the next image and register it to that and you just keep going through this process iteratively until you've combined up to the entire mosaic i talked in more detail about this technique in my, my previous talk so i didn't want to go through all of that again but you'll see some of the capabilities of how i do it here now i would say that when i'm doing narrow band um, mosaics i do build separate mosaics for the h alpha for the s2 and the o3 planes and once i've made those three different mosaics then i combine them together in photoshop with standard um narrowband techniques and i happen to use the, the hubble palette with hydrogen alpha map to green sulfur two to red and or oxygen three to blue and so um once you've once you've got your three your, your three mosaics done you just produce your final um narrowband image so let's just look at a demo now about how we do the blending of two images together in this in this scenario we've got an image of the heart nebula obviously in front of us the next image in the in photoshop here is the soul nebula and we're going to see how we use these two images using register and make a two image mosaic out of it to get started and then you iterate on that and add other images to that over time so there we go so first thing is that's the soul nebula heart nebula now we're going to go into register we're going to load those two images up I find them so they get loaded up and I'm going to register select that and I'm going to say operations register with the heart network, and I'm going to choose
Wall Street. Just give it some moment. Okay. That, that yeah, should, no problem. That should do it. I should do it. You should do it? Yeah. What do you know where we lost sound? Uh just for a moment. We're all good okay. now. All right, okay. So um let me just uh let me just replay this thing again. I'll uh, I'm just gonna move it a bit through to the right place. Yeah, we're just at the point where we join these two together. The painting. There we go. Okay, let's keep going. And all I did at this point was, eh, if you looked closely, there was just a little bit. It's flicking them on and off, blinking like that. You can just see that the top image is a little bit darker than the bottom one. Very slight, but a little bit. So you can just adjust that with curves. And then uh, it will all blend perfectly. And then you save that image and then you add more to it and you just keep going until your mosaic is done. All right. So having if you if you now think about um Kind of when you get to the completion of say the high vision alpha panel right of your mosaic another thing that i that i realized that that really helped when just to get all the blending as neatly done as you possibly could is to again once you've got this final mosaic put it through that star removal filter and now have a look at the background with the stars removed and that once you remove the stars, because the stars you you'll realize cover a multitude of sins in the in in kind of the the background image when you do this, and taking them away gets you gives you a more critical look at where your blending that we just did may not have quite been right, and you can see that there's that there's areas that might be dark around the joins that need to be brightened up. Just go into that and do this so that you can get an absolutely perfect blend underneath the stars and i'll show you that and you know, how i do that it's it's a, and, and and why you would want to do it so so here is um a, a kind of rough version of the 135 millimeter camera lens six image mosaic around cygnus and you can probably already see it kind of looks a bit like well there's a dark patch here that's kind of like one of the one of the blends from one of the uh uh, one of the images of the six images, it didn't quite go right. It's a bit darker up here, but you can't really see quite what's going on because the stars are in the way. So um, th this has been put through uh, the star exterminator. So we've now got a starless layer and a stars layer. And let's see what we do to to get that blending finalized, right? For the for the for the for the uh, for the perfect result. So. You know, take the stars off. Oh, it's very easy to see what's going on now. You can see those dark patches around there. And all I do is I select the areas that are obviously kind of a bit underexposed in the blend. And then I'll just feather the selection, 100 pixels or so. And then we'll remove it, we'll move the selection, hide it. And then we'll just adjust that part of the image with the curves just to make it look a bit more of a natural join because there's obviously something that wasn't quite right there. And that, that looks much more natural to me now. And so you can go through um, the you know individual pieces like this, and uh, it's just showing you, you could, you could keep going at this for a while until really you're just happy with the, the overall end result. And it brightens out there. And I found this actually as uh, it can make quite a big difference to the images. This wasn't too bad, but there's one or two that I found that that really needed this done done on a different number of different areas, and the end result was much better for it. There you go, just brighten that last little bit. Put the stars back. There you go. So um, that's the final step that I do on each of my uh, narrowband uh, filters, was to do that uh, touch up of the background with the stars removed. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the limits of registration, because that six image mosaic of Cygnus 
you can put together with Registar without a problem. But when you start putting, say, two six image mosaics that you've taken together, so now we're trying to build a 12 image mosaic, and this one on the left is the region just below Cygnus of the Milky Way, and this is the region around the central core. So you can see the uh, eagle and lagoon uh, nebulas there. Um, so uh, if you try and put those two together with Registar, this is what you get. <laughs> so what Registar is doing is it's, it's using the information that it has on the overlap, which isn't too big in this situation. And it's trying to use the data it figured out there to project what the rest of the image would have to go. And quite frankly, it didn't get it right. It distorted it. And so now what do you do? How do you get this to work? So how do you get over this limit? The, the problem with, with mosaics is when you get to really large areas of sky, you're dealing with a lot of curvature of the, of the sky. And how do you get a flat version of that? Well, I think in the future, one thing I might do is call up Sean Walker and ask him if I can use some of his hydrogen alpha or sky data to use as my registration template. But without that, this is what I've been doing. So overcoming this limit can be done relatively easily if you're willing to go and just take a mosaic at a much lower focal length with a DSLR. Um, this is the setup I use for that. It's an EOS RA um, on a rainbow astro uh, mount. It's my portable setup. Um, but you can use, you could use just a standard, uh, um, you know, any, any kind of standard sky tracker. It doesn't have to even be a um, equatorial mount. It can just be a standard sky tracker that you can use. And because you're only going to take one minute exposure, so that's all you're going to do. You're going to take a minute exposure of each image just to build up a mosaic of the entire area you want to register to. We're not interested in the faint detail here. We're just interested in getting the star patterns in the right places that we can register those higher resolution astro images to. So you take the you take a few images of the Milky Way, and then you want to register them into a single template and use that to register the, what these 135 millimeter images against. So how do you do that? Well, so the first thing you've got to do is create a mosaic of these low resolution images. And I found again that Registar doesn't work very well on these, but Photoshop does. So I actually used um, the photo, uh, the, like the panorama feature that exists within the camera raw filter of Photoshop and also exists within Lightroom um, to actually be able to take these raw camera raw images from the DSLR straight into the, um, the Photoshop camera raw filter or Lightroom. And then we'll just show, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to create this thing. So you've got your four images in there um, and here's what you do. You select all of them. And then you right click and you hit merge the panorama and it's done. <laughs> that was it. That was all you had to do. So what you do with that panorama then is you save it as a single image. Um, and then uh, what you, you've got to do is you've got, now got to resize it because bear in mind that you've taken a much lower resolution image to get that registration template if you registered your images direct to that all your images are going to get uh, basically sized down to fit that resolution so you're going to lose all your 135 millimeter resolution off the bat so the first thing you've got to do is you've got to resize the template to be the same resolution scale approximately as the images that you're going to be registering to it so if you think about that setup with the dslr that had 5.36 micron pixels and a 35 millimeter lens. If you use this nice little handy astronomy tools calculator, plug those numbers in, it will tell you that's a resolution of 31.59 arc seconds per pixel. And then if you give it the numbers for the Rokinon lens with the ASI 6200, that's 5.74 arc seconds per pixel. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to scale up that 35 millimeter image by that ratio between those two pixel resolutions. Um, so you take the 31.59, which from here, divide it by the 5.74, 5 
I need to make my template 5.5 times bigger in terms of size so I don't lose resolution of the 135 millimeter images when I'm registering to the template. And you can do that very easily in Photoshop using image size. Just make sure the width and height dimensions are locked together so that you're doing a preserve the aspect ratio when you change one of the numbers. I look up the size of that template that, that we just created in Photoshop, uh, and then I'll just multiply the width by 5.5, enter that new width number in pixels, click OK, and it's done. You've got a nice image now that you can use as your template for registering the data together. So here's how we would now overcome that limit that we had in register. And we're going to look at registering these two six image mosaics that were done with 135 millimeters into this panorama that we, we created with the DSLR and resized. So it was approximately the same pixel, uh, um, approximately the same pixel resolution. And here we go. So this time, you know, we're going to take uh, one of those H images, we're going to register it to the panorama and we're going to match it. So we're going to make it fit an exact the image is going to be exactly the same size as the panorama, but that 135 millimeters is going to be exactly where it should be in that field of view. And it's done that, which doesn't take it too long. It's fitted it in. And now we're going to go to the other image once we save that. And we'll do the same registration to the same template and it will put it put that in the proper position oh went a bit too fast there but you get the idea so um now we're going to look at the blending so um you've got those two images registered with the template you bring them into photoshop and you can see hey look that's that's a lot better than register did, right? It's, it's approximately still a square image of the six image mosaic. And it's going to align just beautifully with, with the one next to it that we registered in the template. And uh, we'll just see how we, we do that. Of course, it's very similar to the other technique. We select this image here. We copy it into the other image with the other, the, the other mosaic. I cut away the pixels around this so we can see the two images together. And now we can just do a mask of that top uh, top image, and we can just, you know, paint away the black that we want to to let the blow of picture you know show through. So we paint away there. You can see it's already look at that perfectly aligned. It's always finishing a little early for some reason, and uh, you can get the idea though. Those were the two images, all nice and blended in. Now, finally, uh, what I wanted to talk about was when you kind of finish that mosaic, you built it all up, you've, you know, you've, you've, you've made your color version of it. I, I like to take images that I've taken with my FSQ 106, be it like that Cygnus image um, where there were 63 images and embed it in that 27 image mosaic of the 135 millimeters. I like to take um, those images and, and, and embed them in. And so here's an example of Sharpless 86, a single image, which I don't do very many single images, but that was a single image with the FSQ 106. And I was just starting out on narrowband imaging. Um, and this is the 135 millimeter um, image around uh, just below Cygnus. And there you can see Sharpless 86 is actually in here. It's that, that bit there. But it would be really nice to take the extra detail that's in here and put it in there. And this is where Registar really excels because it will take that image, it will find where it needs to be, and it will resize this image so it's exactly the right resolution. So if we let it do its work, you'll see how all this goes. So we're going to register into the 135 image. All right, found it. And then uh, somehow that uh, didn't get to the end. Let me just do that again. Let me just 
scroll across here because we should have there we go for some reason it was stepping out of all these videos and i'm not quite sure why it didn't do that when i practiced never does does it all right so i'm just going to rewind to here okay so now i'm going to show those two images you bring them into photoshop and uh now what we're going to do is and copy one over the other and now i can i can mask one i can just put a hide all of this of this image i want to kind of help show through and then i just paint over it and let the image the more detailed image show through in photoshop that's how you blend these two different images together once they've been registered and you, that's obviously a bit too dark so i can brighten it up a bit and that looks a bit more natural now um and you can see that it's giving you extra detail and it and it doesn't look out of place. You can blink it on and off, but you can see the extra detail there. And you can do that for as many different bits of the image as you want. And it, it does, I think, with the 135 and the FSQ 106, you get a great blend of resolutions there. And, and if you really want to on this, you can keep going. The, the Cygnus to Sagittarius doesn't have to be where you stop. You can do that. So um, this is the same, this is the same data up to here that we were looking at earlier. Um, and it's combined with other mosaics taken with the 135 and the FSQ 106 over the last couple of years against the star background that's actually taken with a 14 millimeter camera lens. <laughs> so so um, I've combined you know three different focal lengths here. Um, so it's uh, the the end result though it's 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 kind of quite artistic in terms of its color you can't see a lot of the detail but it just gives you that overall sense of the the Im immense amount of nebulosity that exists in the milky way and even at 40 millimeters you can blow that image up and it, it, you can actually pan around there and see a lot of the nebulas you'd recognize you can see the elephant's trunk properly and everything and it's normal 100 percent image ratio but uh eventually what i'd like to do is complete all of this outer line bit in 135 millimeters that will be a project that i do over the next few years but uh it doesn't look too bad even with that and just a final comparison then just to show you the difference between you know the different lenses so this one on the left is obviously cygnus and the central bit is the fsq 106 mosaic but the outer regions were all taken with an 85 millimeter camera lens. And just, and this is like, I finished this like just two weeks ago. I decided to reshoot the 85 millimeter part with the 135. So that's a six image mosaic around Cygnus. And then I put the FSQ 106 data in the middle. Well, wow, I think that's a lot better because the, the stars here are just too big and too grainy really for the central detail. It kind of is a nice effect, but it isn't totally realistic whereas this is you can't tell whether where the 135 data starts and and the fsq data you know uh, when the 135 stops and the fsq data starts it's a very nice uh, kind of kind of blending technique and uh, I, I think i've finally settled on a, a pretty good uh, combination there and that's it really a final image which was something i did uh, a month or so ago it's part of the, uh, you know, the, the the central core of the Milky Way that we were looking at earlier. There's the Cygnus bit. There's the elephant's trunk all the way up to lobster claw and bubble. And that was actually got an amateur astronomy picture of the day and an astronomy picture of the day. So I was quite happy with that. Um, that's it. There's my details. If you have any questions and want to email me, that is my email address. And this is the website where you can find all of these images and many more. So that concludes the presentation. Alistair, there's a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think we have some questions in the room too. How big is that wide field image? Uh, the, let me find the right, you mean, let's go with this one. The last uh, one you showed. Oh, the last me. one, the yeah. very slide, last. Slide 35. Slide 35, okay, oh, good question. Well, okay, up to this point, I think it's 120 degrees. <laughs> so let's say, that's getting on for 180 degrees of sky. So how many pixels is that image? Um, oh boy. Actually, that image is not that many pixels because remember it's all the lowest common denominator on this image, which was the 14 millimeter focal length. 
So on that, it's probably no more than about 12,000 by 2,000, something like that. But you, um, scaled up, you scaled up the lower resolution to match your higher resolution. So that could get pretty big. Yeah, yeah that could get very big. Um, the only one that I've done to its full resolution capability, if you like, is this one. Um, it's this one here. Now that's the 120 degrees, but this is a full resolution of the 135 millimeters because it's all taken at that or better. And that is a large image. In fact, doing the processing on that convinced me I needed to upgrade my desktop. <laughs> and that's that's why I've got a new desktop now. <laughs> so well, how many pixels wide do you think that thing is? Oh, well, why don't we just find out? Hold on. Uh-oh. <laughs> I got to find it first. We, we we don't want to smoke your computer. In the no, no, I've got no. You can't do it now because this is a 128 gig memory, 16 core. I upgraded my computer, so it's all good. Um, where is it? All right, we tried to. Uh, wrong one. Hold on. All right, it's this one. Yeah, it's this one. Let's find out how big it is. So we're holding our breath, Alistair. I know, I know. Sorry, it's going to take me just a second here. Do you need some music here as, as we hold up? <laughs> I've got to remember what, where the final version of this was. Here it is. Here no, I think, we're, I think I was going to use the uh, da, 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 da. All right, you want a size? Here it is. All right, let's get it. 22,000 by 6,000. Yikes. Now, if you were to display that at one by one, Away at one to one, what's it look like? Well, here let me do, I mean, do do something else. Bring up bring up your resize when you just had it. Mm hmm Where you change. Yep. Okay. So let's say uh you know, that's at 300 DPI. So how many inches? Put that in inches. Just I'm curious. In inches. No, in inches. No, in pixels per inch. Oh, you want this in inches? Yeah. You can make a six foot long, 300 DPI image out of that. Oh yeah, yeah. You can go. You can go well, pretty large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could you could divide um, at 300 DPI. What is that number? 74,000. Um, I no, can't. No, it's 74 it. inches. It's that's yeah. you, oh, 74 inches. Yeah, translated. Yeah, okay. the DPI, it's a 74 inch image. Okay. Now, could you go back to showing us what it looks like at one to one, or you know, mm -hmm. pick an object yeah, and sure. show us what an object looks like at one to one? I didn't get a chance to see that. Yeah, really. yeah, we can do that. Okay. Look. All right. There's some of the Sharpless stuff. There's a the North American Pelican. These these are all taken. This is an FSQ 106 resolution, and then yeah, up cool. here, up here is more the more of the native 135 resolutions. But you can go, you can pan around, around and look at everything. I'm sitting on so, some FSQ 106 and broken on 135 mosaic data myself, but like uh -huh. too afraid to process them. <laughs> so, so let me ask another question. Uh, there's another group that looks for planetaries. Do mm -hmm. you ever look through your H alpha and O3 data to see whether you might spot a, a new planetary or two? I have not actually. I was I was pretty I was pretty disappointed in myself that I never thought to do any O3 imaging around Andromeda after I saw that that very nice nebula that was discovered there. Um, but I no I, I had not really I've looked at a few objects and gone what's that? But every time I've I've looked at it that there's always been something that yeah that that's known about. This thing here by the way that's the um, dumbbell interestingly enough. Yeah, there's actually a database of planetary nebula database where you have proposed and some that are confirmed and i think there's 474 planetary images and dressler's name is on half of them. okay very interesting <laughs> they, they are the man uh there was a question online and again i i would just read it as it as it stated norm said so when you are blending the black areas Mm -hmm. Is it just creating fake data? No, I don't think so. No, no. So, mm -hmm. so what you're doing there is is um, uh, you've got two two images in in two different layers, and one image has black has the black because it's 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 black area is is on top of 
the area underneath that you want to, sh to show through. So what you're doing is you're using that layer brush to basically say where I'm painting on that layer, that I want the image data underneath to show through. And so you, you're, you're taking away the black edge of one image to let the real data of the other image show through. So you end up with a completely real data image. There's absolutely no fakery involved in that. Yeah, you know, I, I do a lot of blending mm -hmm. of, of images and I find that irregular selections that are feathered gives me a much more natural look because Anything that's a straight line in any way, no matter how good you are, your eye will pick that up. Oh, so, I, very much so. I, and I, that's, I, I, I do the same thing that you do. I, I, I tend to move my brush around. I've got, it's certainly not a, a regular line that I end up with at the overlap. But even then you get these things around the edges that, that I like to correct now by at the final mosaic stage, just removing the stars so I can see what's really going on. And then, mm -hmm. and then altering the brightnesses just a bit to match everything up and then putting the stars back. In, in those kinds of selections, an unsteady hand is an advantage. <laughs> As opposed, no, it is because- Oh, it's true, it's true. Yeah, and then an irregular, the more detail and, and precise you are, the more you're gonna see the interface. Mm -hmm. uh, another question came up while we were chatting from Chris. Please comment on whether you rotate the field of view or how much you overlap frames and to overcome uh, the field. Yeah, really, really good question. Um, I don't rotate at all. Um, I just take the rotation because I don't have a rotator on the telescope set up. Um, so I take the position that I put it in when I put the camera on the telescope. And I, I just, you know, the, the, as you saw from the planning software, it knows from images already taken by that camera set up in the profile it knows what it's rotated at. So it knows where the camera is going to be rotated to, and it will show me that real on the sky. And you just have to, to live with the, ro the rotation that I've got. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, what was the second part of the question? Cause that was a, that was another good part. The second, was the second part. Or how much overlap on frames? Overlap. Yeah. So the overlap you can configure. Um, I go with 15%. Um, I think that's, that's that you wouldn't want to go much below that um 15 seems to work fairly well for the registration software it gets it right unless you go into too wide a field of view uh, but you can overlap it more you just select that in the in the in the planner and it will adjust your image panes accordingly and um, there was a slider in there that you could you know at 20 percent, 30 percent, whatever you wanted but i go with 15. Uh, by the way i must say chris that was a very intelligent question it was <laughs> yeah I think those so, are all the questions online. Any questions in the room? Yeah, I've got one, Alistair. Uh, you had mentioned that the way you, with these narrowband images, that essentially creating one mosaic for each of the emission mm -hmm. line, right? So the HA, the, and so yeah. do, instead, these are some fairly large uh, mosaics with a number of panels. Do you find that there's a practical limit to how many panels you can put together before it starts to just kind of fall apart? Yeah, yeah. So um, my the practical limit for the 135 images seems to be about six, so a three by two. Um, and then if you try and join much more than that together in the register, then you end up with the next image you register. It's it's all bone. It, it just can't figure out enough from the overlap what to do with the rest of the image because there's too much curvature by that point. And so that's where you have to go and take the lower resolution image and use that as your registration template to get around that. Uh, but as I was saying, if, if Sean Walker would give me access to his, uh, his uh, H Alpha Sky survey, I, I've got all the templates I'll ever need for registration. You know, I've made the same request for Sean and I think what he said was he's not in control of who's mm -hmm. going to use this data, but at some point it's going to be made public. Wow. And that anyone should have access. So I really, I had the same thought in mind. We're, we're actually using his HA data as just, you know, to, to give the HA emission background for any image. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it, it's an invaluable resource that. Yeah, it's going to be great. And another question came up while we were chatting um, from Chris. Roughly how many hours per panel do you try to collect? Yeah, um, so 
typically on these ones, I was doing two, well, each, each filter of each image was about two to two and a half hours, each 10 minute subs. And, and that, that gave you enough signal to drag out some pretty good detail in the faint background. Um, it probably could have, it could have been better with a bit deeper, but I've got to say that with the, you know, the star exterminator tool and the, and the noise exterminator tool, you can pull out some pretty faint detail from not too much, uh, not too many deep images. You know, I, we have stimulated our, our group out there to ask questions at last. Oh, great. Day. So next one is uh, flats. How do you take flats for the 135? Ah, well, I'll reach behind me. Flat master. So Flatmaster. Um, that is a Pegasus Astro. I'll just un unbox it and you can see what it does. The great thing is that I'm still using the flats I took a year ago. There's no dust motes or anything. I don't understand why not, but I don't need any more than the first set of flats I took. But that that you just put that over the top of the lens. You you, you move the mount so the lens is upright, pointing to the sky. Put that on the top, adjust the brightness, and that's your flat. You, you probably don't have any dust mode because you have glass in front of it. That's probably <laughs> true. <laughs> I get dust motes uh, extensively on the FSG 106. I have to take flats every night with that one, but then I've got the flip flat. And next question from Isaac is, where is your scope located? Don't be too precise with this. Oh, no, no, that's all right. Yeah, I should, I meant to mention that at the beginning. Yeah, um, I, mine is in Tucson, Arizona, in my backyard, um, which, it, you know, I, you can tell by my accent, I, I'm from the UK and, uh, I lived there till I was 40. And then I moved to, to, to Tucson for work reasons. I was back in 2005. Uh, and that's when my astrophotography took off because if you're in the UK, it's cloudy most nights. If you're in Tucson, it's clear most nights. And you just get so much more opportunity to image that you can go through the learning curve more quickly. And uh, so from my perspective, that, that, that my location really enabled me to get better and better and better and it's since i came to tucson that my imaging has got, got a, a lot better than it used to be and another question boy we got a ton of questions coming up here at the end uh isaac also wants to know what's the bortle rating where you're imaging now it is bottle four well that's not bad it's narrow band so I can do RGB imaging um, at Bottle Four. That it's I'm I'm in the northwest of Tucson, out of the major city lights, so um, it's it's a better area for dark skies. But last time I looked, it was Bottle Four. Which way is Tucson? Uh, what part of the sky is lit up? Um, what What do you mean? Well, is it is it north of you or south or east? Or... Um, it, oh, the the of me, it's. The southeast is lit up. So you got that whole northern sky, which is I do. Pretty good target. The bad news is that Orion, when that comes around, tends to be in the brighter area. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I can live with it. It's in the south. Uh, have you? I think that what you have might be amusing quality image. You think you have any inquiries for people that want to print that and put it up somewhere as a display? Yeah, I, I I haven't heard yet. It's, it's something I need to do is, uh, and I've always said I'm, I'm waiting till I have more time in my retirement right, so I can have uh, some more time to do stuff. I do want to set up the ability to sell these images, but uh, but right now, no, no one's, uh, this has only been out for, I would say, a um, couple of months, so uh, no interest yet, but it, it's surprising. You get, you get inquiries eventually when you least expect it. I've got a lot of these images tend to go on calendars and magazines. I've even got some in a book, uh, but uh, but no interest yet from the museum. They might be good though. It would be a good thing to have on the wall, six feet long. And and Isaac yet has another question. Uh, do you see any gradients that you have to deal with? Yeah, that is a really good question actually. Um, so it depends is the answer. Uh, with the narrowband filters, you tend not to get much in the way of gradients you've got to deal with. In fact, I would say that in everything of the 135 millimeter that's on here, I don't think I didn't use the gradient exterminator on it. Um, I 
because I tried it and I was like, no, it doesn't I don't look like it should. And a lot of the gradients were actually real and meant to be there. So for example, um, as you get lower in the sky and this get, you know, you're getting some of the sky glow here, you do see gradients down here that, that if you took them out, it would make the image not look right. So um, mostly I don't use gradient removal now on these types of images, but every now and again, you get one that you're just like, no, that looks right. That, Maybe, the, maybe I've got too much moonlight here and I need to balance that out. And then I would use the tool um, and, it, and, and it blends in okay. You know, when you deal with narrow band images, you gotta be very careful on what's a gradient. Mm -hmm. Because as we, we found out more recently than not, every bit of the sky has a little bit of hydrogen alpha emission anywhere near the Milky Way. It does. And I was, I was surprised that when I looked in some of the, the images of the 135, I'm like, whoa, there's a whole load there I didn't realize was there. <laughs> So what is it you're removing with a gradient? Where, where, would exactly. you, where would you say is a dark part of that image that you can use as a marker? And the answer would be, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I only ever use it if I think there's something there that's causing a gradient that isn't the sky. And that's very rare. So are those three nanometer or five nanometer filters? No, here? I think these are seven nanometers. Seven? I think that's all the questions. I got, no, I got one for you. Just added one for you, Eric. Um, you you shoot at f4. That's true, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And uh, the that lens uh, starts out at an f2. The 135 mm -hmm. does. Do you stop the lens down just with the with the uh, sh what is that the, the aperture leaves uh, or um, do you use aperture rings to shut it down? Uh, no, I just to, I just use the aperture leaves, the one with the dial on the. I just okay. use the dial on the lens. Do you ever see the diffraction spikes coming off the stars? No, from look. the aperture leaves. Yes, there they are, but they're not very big. <laughs> yeah, like right, like that that one right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You do um, see it, but it's very very tiny. There, there you go. Yeah. Well, wow, sure. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna try to do something with with mine. I've got a set of aperture rings, and I'm gonna stick them in there and see if I can get it to make a difference. I think anyone that zooms in on an image and pixel peaks on that, after all that work, you know what to say to them. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't pixel peep my images because if I do, I don't like it. <laughs> It's, it's the overall effect. Who cares exactly, about whether exactly. it's a it pixel. looks like at its full width? Exactly. Is there, uh, Isaac is asking if there's any place to download the full res picture so we can play with it. <laughs> um, yes, well, there, although I'm getting on my outlook coming up here. Um, yes, the, yeah, you go to my I website. <laughs> can, can you take us? <laughs> Yes, you can oh. get this on my website. Yes, you can find it. Can you it. go over to can you go over to your website and show us sure. a little bit? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Uh do that here. Don't leave the meeting. Don't no, I won't. I won't. I'll do it. I'll do close this tab, window. The tab. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you can get it here. Um, there's this one we were talking about. There's the I've very shared, large image. I've shared and, the link in the okay. uh, chat. And and I think yeah that is full size yeah it says it in the name yeah so I, sometimes I don't always post the full size I might post like fifty percent mm -hmm. but uh, this is really the full size. It's taken a while that's for sure. Yeah let's uh, <laughs> let's, let's go back. Alistair, yeah. Alistair I, I made up a collage not a mosaic but a collage uh, of my favorite images uh -huh. that I've taken through the years yep. so that I could put it on the side of my RV. Oh, so that nice. the top two feet all the way along my 22 foot RV has got astro pictures all the way along. And that is one immense file because I had to take it down to the guy that prints these stuff on vinyl mm -hmm. and he put it up there. It looks pretty cool, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a huge file. It takes forever to do anything with it. Yeah, this is a big file, as you can see. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> But anyway, um, uh, people can go out there and play with it. That's what it's there for. I can tell you that if you try to print these at 300 DPI museum quality on a quality printer, like on metal, uh, I think you'd, you'd be another mortgage on the house. 
Yes, yes, exactly. I tend to stop at around 20 by 30 inches on the metal prints. That's that's expensive mm -hmm. enough. I mean, yeah, a 24, a, yeah, custom a 24 frame. by 36 on a metal print where I haven't printed, it'd be two to three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So just do the math on a 74. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's where it's a non standard print. I think it was going to be at least a thousand, I would think. Oh, no, no. I, I think it'd be more like three or four thousand. Oh, geez. To have a single panorama like that. But it would be an incredible image. Uh, yes, Nick, would. Nick swims fast. That's cool, Nick. How do you know that you've reached the desired stretch? Uh, how do you know that you've got the hue and color oh. calibrated or any point of the process? That's a good question. So um, when you build, I mean, a lot of it is is by eye. I've got to say that. Uh, maybe there's a more scientific way to do it, but I don't know it. So when you're putting the individual images together in the mosaic, you're going to be blending each image as close you, as you can together. And when you get to the overall one, you get the overall sense of the image. You can kind of see where, where you might have got the blend a little bit out in certain areas because it doesn't, the transition doesn't look even. Like when I was going in and adjusting those joins after I completed the mosaic with the stars removed, that was there to make it all kind of look right on each of the filters. And then so you've kind of balanced each of the filters as much as you can that way. And then when you put them together, then yes, you might find, and you, I do find that there's some areas of the image where it looks like, for example, oh, I've, I've combined that for the first time. And there's this big red, red dominant area over here, where over this other area, I might have um, a more greenish area from the, the, the hydrogen alpha combination. And, and if you see like an area which is just obviously looks like it's been too dominant from one of the filters, you just, all I do is I select that area of the of, of that particular red, green or blue channel, and I just pull it down if it's over dominant until it blends, until it blends with the rest. And, and you'll, your eyes will tell you when it kind of looks right. So um, it, it's, it's a bit kind of by eye, um, but the great thing about narrowband images is it's all false color anyway. <laughs> so, um, to an extent you know, that uh, as long as it looks right, it's right. Now, I imagine you reach the Photoshop limit, file limit on TIFF pretty quickly. Yeah, you have to save it as a Photoshop uh, large document. Large, large document, which uh, yeah, there, probably uh, heats up your, your PC no matter how many cores you've got. That's why yeah, got yeah it was, I, my life's a lot easier since I upgraded my desktop about a month ago. It's, 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 I can actually get things done a lot faster. Wow. Well, and that blending technique you use, I mean, that's where f using Photoshop is, 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 you know, something you can do if, because you can just select certain areas and then, mm -hmm. and just treat that, uh, you know, if, let's say you were trying to do this type of work in PixInsight. I don't know how you would do that. You, if you, did it would be a lot more difficult so yeah i mean that's why i i mean i've done the, some basic pix insight tutorials and yeah I, I kind of figured that that a lot of the stuff that i do and the way i do it it wouldn't it wouldn't translate now having said that i use pix insight for other things i i'm processing like one shot color images then yep pix insight does it because my other techniques um aren't as good but i always end up back in photoshop at the end I think we woke up Isaac. He must have had a couple extra cups of coffee because he has another question. All right. Oh, two questions. Oh my gosh. Here, take a pause, Isaac. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. We appreciate it actually. Yes, we, we do appreciate it. And if we tease, it's only because we love you all. What narrow bands were used in the image? So it's sulfur, oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen. That's right. right? I mean, that's, 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 those are yep. the three. That's the three. Uh, have you heard of gradient? Yeah, gradient merge mosaic is is the process in Pix Insight, and I've used it before, and it works. And I think there's a more contemporary process, uh, a script. Yeah, there's a there's a Pix photometric Insight. merge mosaic or something like that now as well. Yeah, but gradient merge mosaic it works pretty well, and basically you do the same thing in a different way is that mm -hmm. you put you put the images together roughly and then you use that as a template 
to register each individual and then combine them. And it works yeah. pretty well. Yeah, I mean, there's I, I know there's other packages and processes out there that 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 may even be, that may be better than what I do, maybe quicker. That's the most important thing. But uh, I've got to try them at some point, and I will get around to it. All right. We have quite an audience tonight because we got another question. My gosh. Uh, any opinions on three nanometer filters versus sevens? I, I mean, I, honestly, I've thought about that, and I think I could benefit from going to the to the to the three nanometer, especially. I mean, I, I, in the O3, I think that if, you look, if I look at my O3 images with the seven there's a lot of skylight in there and i think that they would benefit from being that would benefit from being a, a, a narrow band pass um so i think i think you'd get more detailed more contrasty images i think at the three nanometers is what i would assume but i'm but i'm pretty pleased with the seven nanometers it's, it's every now and again i wish the the, the o3 was a bit better well, sure, you could invest another uh, $4,000 in filters and another two years in redoing yep. all of what you've done before. Uh, yeah, I don't intend to do this. <laughs> and, and actually, there's a comment uh, from Josh. I've never had good results with gradient merge mosaic. And Josh, I've had excellent results with gradient merge mosaic. So I think it's, it's more likely some, mm -hmm. some technique or maybe data. Problem. But yeah, it's it's a good tool. But if you're going to go into PixInsight and look at gradient or uh, mosaics, you should get the more contemporary tool, which maybe we can cover in another show. It sounds like it's oh. right up Adam Block's alley if we want him to come back. He's been talking about it lately. Yeah. Yep. Or uh, a couple other people could do it. I I think we're we're there. All right. I think so. So yeah, Alistair, this has been amazing. This has been fascinating, the presentation. And, and uh, you know, you did show some some of your website here, but uh, which it's impressive just on YouTube, but I would really encourage everyone to go to the website and take a look at some of these images because when you click on these larger, uh, the larger ones, you can, you, you can, I know we said you don't want to pixel peep too much, but you can really, you know, kind of, zoom in and 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 see some pretty amazing details so i spent some time looking at that before, you know earlier today and and it's uh it's really it's really neat so and that website is woodlandobservatory.com it is and uh we put that into the uh into the I description the and we put it in yeah. the chat as well yeah. so everybody should yeah. uh, go crash that website and take a look at it with everybody looking at it at the same time so <laughs> yes that would be that would be impressive i've never had my website go down <laughs> all right well thank you again and mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like we're done with all the questions so all right take us out molly okay. thank you all right we'll see all everybody right. next week bye, bye everybody bye everybody